father tried to strangle her, leaving scratches and bruises around her neck. Within three weeks of starting sick form, Shavelia, a keen student, started showing long periods of absence. Her sister Alicia told friends that their parents were keeping her at home. Reports were made to social services, and in one phone call made to the family home, Iftika told the teacher that he had burned all of her textbooks. The number of physical assaults were increasing. She went back to school in October 2002 and had visible injuries to her neck and a cut lip. She told a teacher that her mother had held her down while her father had hit her, and social services were again informed. Around this time, Shavelia told her close friend, Melissa Bowner, that her mother had said, I can't wait till you go to Pakistan to teach you a lesson. And you're adopted, you're not my daughter. Despite this, the social services case was closed after Shavelia played down her problem and said she did not want them to intervene. Friend Melissa said, once she told me how she'd been dragged out of her bed by her parents in the middle of the night, and they both beat her, but she wasn't sure why. Shavelia had such spirit. She told me once she'd been having dinner, and her mother hit her on the back with a broom for some reason. She told her mother it didn't hurt, so she hit her again much harder. Her parents even forced her to reveal the PIN number of the Barclays bank account where she put her savings from a part-time call centre job, says Melissa, who was with her when she discovered the account was empty. The bank assistant told her someone had been withdrawing £200 every day for a while. She always tried to make light out of a bad situation. I remember her making a joke about it, saying her parents had probably spent the money on the new sofa that had arrived at the house. In November, Shavelia ran away for the second time. The parents report her missing again. She was found in a park with her bags. They had a meeting at school with her parents, and she went back home after spending a night at a friend's house. A few months later, in February 2003, Shavelia runs away again, this time for 12 days. This was after weeks of planning, helped by Melissa, a most significant attempt to escape her parents. Iftika had already booked tickets for Pakistan, with the possibility of a forced marriage looming, so there was no time to lose. Melissa said, for a while beforehand, she'd been bringing clothes into school in carrier bags and keeping them in her locker. None of us had a car, but a friend we knew as Mushy, who was a bit older, had one, so we brought him into it. In the early hours of February the 1st, Mushy, whose real name was Mushtag Bacchus, described in court as a boyfriend of Shavelia's, was directed to Shavelia's home in a mobile phone conversation with Melissa. At an arranged time, Shavelia climbed out of a downstairs window because her father, who was out working the Friday night taxi shift, was in the habit of locking the family in the house from the outside. After two nights in Blackburn at Mushy's brother's house, Shavelia was brought back to Warrington to try and find her accommodation through the council. She was taken in by social services and registered herself as homeless. She reported to counsellors about her fears of being forced into an arranged marriage in Pakistan. This was documented and signed by Shavelia. She stayed at Melissa.
case had gone cold until finally a body was found 100 miles away. It had been washed up from a river after a flood where some workmen were at. The body was decomposed and dismembered due to a strong current. It needed identifying. Over two weeks later it was confirmed to be the body of Shavilia Ahmed. There were no broken bones or other physical injury that could be concluded, so it was suggested that strangulation or suffocation was the likely cause of death. The parents were then arrested and questioned. There was not enough evidence to make a charge and so they were released on bail. It's likely the family and extended family colluded to make sure their stories were the same. As when questioned, Shavilia's siblings all gave the same account as Fazana and Iftika, that she had run away from home and they didn't see anything else happen to her. Throughout the murder inquiry, no one from the community or any religious leaders spoke out to say that this was not part of their religion and culture, which it's not, or even recognize it as abuse. There was complete silence. Shavilia's funeral took place in August 2004. Police knew there was unlikely to be any progress in the case unless someone within the family was prepared to come forward. And that someone would be Shavilia's sister, Alicia, the second eldest. Years later, Alicia opened up to Shavilia's friend, Shahi, and described to her the abuse that Shavilia had gone through. The same thing was now happening to Alicia. Everything she did was being controlled, watched and monitored. She had become scared for her own life. Five years after Shavilia's death in 2008, an inquest was made. The coroner determined that 17-year-old Shavilia had indeed been murdered, and this was an unlawful killing. If Dicker unsuccessfully challenged this decision, and took the coroner to court. In August 2010, now seven years after Shavidia's death, there was a robbery at the family home. While Iftika was working, three masked men armed with a gun, iron bar and hammer broke into the house, tied up Fazana and three of her children. The brother was kicked and one of the sisters was hit with a hammer. They stole jewellery and £3,000 of cash before leaving. Alicia Ahmed was then arrested and questioned. Alicia admitted to organising the robbery on her parents' house. At this time she was 22 years old and had been living on her own. She was struggling for money and her parents refused to help. In desperation, she contacted the men to conduct the robbery. She told the court, I think I just absolutely snapped. It was either living the way they wanted me to live, or living on my own, and both were a struggle. However, she said, the gang turned on her, and after hearing them saying her name, her mother and brother became suspicious and told the police she was given a 12-month suspended sentence. While in police custody, Alicia asked if she could talk to them about another matter. She decided she wanted to tell them about her sister's death. In her statement, she described what happened that day seven years ago. Despite being constantly threatened by her parents to keep quiet, the truth was finally coming out. This was what the police had been waiting for. They now had what they needed to prosecute Iftika and 
precisely matched with what Alicia had said. It just wasn't plausible that this could be a story she made up. Iftika said Shavilia ran away from home in the middle of the night and he never saw her again. Fazana had denied claims that they attacked Shavilia, but during the three-month trial she changed her story, claiming she saw her husband beat their daughter on the night of the murder. She tried to intervene, but was punched. She also claimed he had threatened to do the same thing to her and their other children if she ever asked him what happened to Shavilia. After two days of deliberation, Iftika and Fazana were convicted to life imprisonment with a minimum of 25 years without parole. When the verdicts were delivered, Fazana was crying, and as Iftika was led away, he swore at the police officers. The children that were still loyal to the couple, Mevish, Junyad, and the youngest, all broke down in tears. Alicia was given witness protection from her family, and will likely remain there for the rest of her life. What happened to Shavilia was truly horrific, and she is not alone. The UN estimated 5,000 women and girls are murdered every year in honor killings, but the real number may be much higher. Thank you for watching.